You see, it says here, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now, how many have read this and they, they say, Well, I believe this refers to the building of the temple in the last days, right? And it does. But there's something else that it refers to as well. And I don't mean to take away from that because it does refer to the, that there will be a new temple. You are the temple of God. He says, measure the temple. It's 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know you not, you not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? He's going to measure. And the question we need to ask ourselves is... Do you measure up? Do you measure up? And here's several scriptures here. 1 Peter 2, 5. You, ye are also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We have in 1 Peter 4, 17 through 18, for God, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. See, the first one we read, there's a spiritual house, right? The spiritual house is the temple. John is told to measure the temple. So we got the spiritual house. Then he says the judgment must begin at the house of God. The church, again, it's like they have a silent ear. Remember those 10 days of... God is inspecting us right now. We've come into a place... Where God is examining, are we going to be, what are we going to, when he says measure the temple, he's measuring the church and saying, are you going to measure up to leave in the rapture when, when the final trumpet blows? The time has come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. If it begins with us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And then he adds, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In other words, we need to get serious with, it's time to get serious with God. We're running out of time. And if we're not ready, if we're playing games with God, we need to just get straight now. Because he's coming and he's coming quickly. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 says, But Christ is son over his own house, whose house we are, right, the temple, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. See, we're not just automatically the house. He says, if... Now, what we've done in the church is we cross these words out in our mind. If. You know, we read that before with Jesus. If. What does if mean? It's conditional, right? I'm telling you, the rapture is not an automatic. Yes, you come to Christ, he will save you, but the rapture is not an automatic. And it says here, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm till the end. And how do you do that? That's what the scripture is going to show us. In Ephesians chapter 2, 20 through 22, he said, And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Notice he's talking about a building. And the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So here again, we have... The building, the foundation, we're stones in this temple. Second Thessalonians says this, and this is kind of interesting here. Verse 2 through, uh, 3 through 4, chapter 2. Let no man deceive you. You know what let means? That means you have a choice. Right? You can let somebody do something, you can let them not do it. 
And the word let here means you have a choice. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. In other words, you can prevent being deceived. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And there is. There has been a falling away. For, even though it looks like there's great church numbers. Some churches are super churches. But their life, they've been falling away. And part of it is because they've been, they've been kind of taught a kind of corrupt gospel. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know that title was only used in one other person? His name was Judas. He was one of the twelve. And yet Jesus said, one of you has a devil. Right? Or one of you is a devil. I believe this is saying, watch this, he says, this person opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, using the illusion of the building and the temple, the scripture says measure the temple. Here we have a scripture, it says that this son of perdition opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, that he is God, sits in the temple, showing himself that he is God. This person is one of us. Just like Judas was one of the twelve, this person could be a very tremendously respected religious leader in Christianity, and yet he's a devil. And it says that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. And that is worship, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Just because someone has a big following, just because someone's very well known on national television, does not mean you can trust them. It say, he also says here, he's measuring, remember, he's measuring the temple, and he says, you are the temple, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. Don't measure those that are out. He's telling the Spirit, the Spirit is saying, we're, we're going to measure the people inside, not the ones outside. In other words, this measurement has nothing to do with those people out there He's concerned about the people in the church. In warning, he says, we're going to see if they measure up. It is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread under 40, uh, a foot 40 and two months. That's 1260 days, and we'll see that later. You'll notice the scripture in 2 Corinthians here. Paul says... We will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. This measuring is the same thing John is told to do, to measure. And the word here, the measure of the rule is canon. The word in Greek means a rod or straight piece of rounded wood to which anything is fastened to keep it straight. That rod is Christ. What, what, it mean, what, what it's saying is the canon here is meant for you to fasten yourself to so you'll be safe. Think about someone who maybe broke their back. And so you put a rod down their spine so they can't move. They're fastened to the rod. As long as they have that rod, maybe they'll still be alive. Friends, we in the church, nobody ever said that we were perfect or that we're all better now. We need that rod of support, which is Christ. We need to be fastened. And here's what we do. 
It's like that guy that broke his back. It's got a rod there to keep him alive. And he said, wow, this is uncomfortable being fastened to this rod. I can't do anything being fastened to this rod. And so we take the rod off. In other words, we're supposed to stay fastened to Christ. That's what he's saying. And yet, we want to sin. I mean, I could ask for a show of hands, how many would like to sin? Well, we're not supposed to like to sin, but we do sin. But you know why we sin as much as we do? is because we think it's uncomfortable to have that rod in our back. And there's some things you can't do as long as you have, you're fastened to the rod. And that's what it's meant. It's meant for you not to, not to be loosed from Christ. He's going to keep you straight. On the straight and on the narrow. If that person removes that brace from his back, he's going to break his neck and whatever, right? Right? Okay, there's some more meaning of the word here. Uh, also, it means uh, a measuring rod or a rule or a carpenter's line or measuring tape. And that's what we saw in, when, in that picture where he's measuring the temple, right? How many know what a plumb line is or, or even a measuring tape? Now, I, see, I had to learn this from my wife because my way of doing things, eyeball it. If I'm going to put a shelf up in my house, I go, well, that looks about right. And somebody says, well, you know what? You put, should have put a balance on it because if you put a ball on there, it's going to roll right off. And my response is, I don't put balls up there. So, so it's good enough. But my wife taught me, no, you measure. You measure. You put a balance. She measures everything. When she does um, uh, the wallpaper, she, met, she draws lines on the wall, right? I'm like, I can't believe you've got to do all this. I would have just put the wallpaper up. And someone would say, well, you know, this way goes that way and this way goes... I didn't even know you're supposed to match it. I just thought they were pictures on the wall. And no, you've got to match it all up. That's what he's talking about here. Christ is the measuring line. He's that stick. He's that plumb line, and you're supposed to stay as close as you can to him. Why? So you don't sin. So your life counts. I have that one scripture up in there in the corner, because verse 4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, which are lights, standing before the God of the earth. Now we know that there's the two witnesses that come literally, Enoch and Elijah, in the last days and they're going to build the temple. We've, we talked about it and we will talk about that more. But here, when he's talking about measuring the church, I believe these two, these two olive trees and candlesticks represent the Old and the New Testament. And you know what? What do we call... What do we call the Bible? The canon. The canon of the scripture. It's not artillery. The canon, we get, we get the Old Testament from the old Jewish canon. In other words, the books were already selected. I didn't choose what went in my Bible. It was already selected, right, by the prophets. And when Jesus was on the earth, he testifies to everything in the apostles of what belonged in the Old Testament. And then you've got the New Testament writings. You cannot come along because the canon's already there. You can't just add any old book that you want and put it in the Bible. Let's, let's, let's look at how foolish it is because the Roman Catholic Church did that. They took all this apocrypha. They put all these writings in the book. And there's people today saying, oh, this book belongs there and this book belongs there. No, your Bible is complete the way it's supposed to be. And you don't have any authority to put anything else in there or add anything to it or take anything away. Some people want to rip things out. I don't believe that. The Muslims do that with the Bible. Well, we believe Jesus was a prophet, but we don't believe in the church. 
So we'll just rip out everything the church wrote. Well, you can't do that. That's not the canon. The canon, remember, the canon is the measuring line. They explain this here in Zechariah 4, verses 1 through 6. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, his seven lamps thereon, seven pipes of the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, two olive trees by it, and one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side thereof. I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? The angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and said, look at this word, this is the word of the Lord. He's talking about the same thing we see in Revelation chapter 11 and Zechariah chapter 4. He said, this is the word of the Lord on Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord. Now think about this. When you are saved, you become the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God, and He lives inside you, right? But just like the tabernacle, there's a light. When the Spirit of God comes into you, there is a light that lightens up the tabernacle on the inside, and that's the light that's that's supposed to guide you through life. And this is, what he's saying is, this is a picture of how it works. This is the Word. You see, you have the two olive trees... That's the Old and the New Testament. Out of the Old and the New Testament come forth the oil. Remember the the parable? There's ten virgins, five had oil, five did not. And they said, well, you're going to have to go out to the ones who sell it to get the oil. You know where you get the oil? From the Word. You get the oil. The oil is the spirit that comes out of the Word of God, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. This is what's going on inside you. You have a menorah inside you, a lamp. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you see you have here, you have two pipes coming out. The pipe is draining oil into a bowl, and the bowl has seven chutes or channels that go and put oil into the lights. Your light will go out if it doesn't get any fuel. You know, you can think about this as uh, an engine with seven cylinders. Does that, does it make sense? Have a a seven, not eight cylinders or six, a seven cylinder engine. You got an engine inside you. That's the spirit of God, God put inside you. But just like when you when, when you get the warning light, it flashes red. Mine even makes a sound, ding, 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 ding. You're running out of gas. Let me, let me show you how ridiculous this, this is that people do. Let's say you're coming home from work. You're, you have the flashing light. You're running out of gas. Ding, 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 ding. You're driving past the gas station, but you say, I can't stop right now because the wife said, get home because she had something for me to do. And I know I got enough gas to get home. So I get home. I should have stopped and got gas. I make it home, and then there's some emergency. Did I do a bad thing going, going home? No, I did a good thing. I'm doing what my wife wanted, right? But now, let's say my wife falls down the stairs. Because I don't want to be the one to fall down the stairs. So if my wife falls down the stairs, i got to take her to the emergency room. So I put her in the car. I get in the car and say, ding, 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 ding. I don't have time to stop. So I'm doing a good thing. And I run out of gas. Whose fault is it? I was doing a good thing, but I ran out of gas. And people say, well, you know, I don't have time to read the Bible because I go to work and I provide for my family. And that's a good thing. But guess what? You're running out of gas. You can get so busy doing good things in the church 
that you don't have time to read the Bible. But you're running out of gas. You're running out of fuel. Eventually, your light will go out. And when your light goes out, you don't have no light inside you. Besides that, there's seven flames there for a reason. If, a, if, a, if an engine has eight cylinders, what happens when you're only running on six of them? It's not running right. You notice there's these channels that come from the bowl and bring the oil to the individual light. What happens if they get clogged? What happens? The light's going to go out. Well, that's okay. I got another one. I have seven lights. So this one goes out, and that one goes out. And you know what, ha- you know what clogs it up? Gum. Gum or dirt or... You know what that is? That's sin. Sin in your life, even though you're, you're hearing the word of God and the oil's coming in the bowl, it's not getting to you because of sin. You're clogging up the channels. And if you keep doing that, you will eventually fall away from God. And is the church being warned? No, they think they're safe. Oh, I'm going to the rapture. While their candles are going out. And they don't even recognize it. It's just like in your house, if you had seven lights in your, in your, in your living room and one light bulb went out, at first you would realize it. Right? You would say, oh, the light bulb went out. But I got six more. But the ne- by the next day, if you don't change the light, by the next day, you're getting used to that light. You don't even realize the light went out. Now another one goes out, and another one goes out. In, in my office, I had one light bulb. I had four, but I had one left. And Laura's like, why do you only have one light bulb? I said, well, they burned out. She said, did you ever think about replacing them? No, I'm like, no, one light is sufficient. I can see. And then she put the light bulbs in, and I'm like, wow, I like light. This is what happens to us spiritually. This is what the church has to realize. This scripture comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah 8, 20. Notice this. The prophet said, to the law and to the testimony... If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what church there is and how popular it is. If they don't speak speak according to the word of God, there's no light in them, no matter how many thousands of people come. And you know it it applies to other religions, because they're not teaching the word of God. If they don't speak according to the words, because there is no light in them. Also, you saw that it, the, the, uh, these candlesticks were called the witnesses. Witness and testimony is basically the same word. In other words, when, when you're in court, if, you're, if you go to court, and the judge, judge has the witness come up, and speak and the witness stand and when he speaks or she speaks they're given a testimony tell me what you saw that's their testimony right notice in Exodus 31 18 and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai he gave him two tables that's with the law right He said, two tables of testimony were written with the finger of God. And then, verse 11 here, then he answered and said, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side? And I answered and said, what be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes emptied the golden oil out of themselves? We've already went through that. And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? I said, no. He says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Again, what stand? What are the anointed ones? 
regarding the temple of God, the church? It's the Bible. And you know, the very next word he said, Then I turned and lifted my eyes and I saw, and this is what he saw. He saw the word. In other words, God is saying, if you, if you miss this, I want to make darn sure you get what I'm saying. This applies to the word of God. These are the anointed ones that you need in your life. The word of God is absolutely required in your life because that's where the fuel comes from. You can't have understanding. You, you can't have the Spirit. In, I mean, you can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's, like, like, it's like there's no fuel to work with. The fuel comes from the Word. And if you don't have the Word, you won't be able to stand. You won't be able... It's like that. Remember the stick. The, the, uh, the, measure, the, uh, the stick went down a guy's back. He was fastened to it. To hold him to... Basically, we said to hold you to Christ. The only way that's going to work is if you have the Bible inside you. The only way to get it inside you, I'm, uh, it's unfortunate, but you have to let it in. You only have so many gates. You know what the gates are? You have to come through your eyes or your ears, right? In order to get the word into your heart. It has to go through these channels. That's your fuel. I want to finish uh, reading down here about Zechariah. Um, you remember this scripture from Isaiah, though. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. If they don't speak according to the word, it's because there's no light in them. Doesn't matter what excuses they have. Well, this is not the gospel of today. The gospel of today is to build a super mega church, seeker friendly. Where is that in the Bible? God didn't call you to preach somebody's idea of church growth. He called you to preach and teach the Word of God. And then He'll do the rest. He'll do the rest. But you got to do what you were called to do. And that's what you were called to do. He didn't call us to sing, My baby does a hanky-panky. He called us to sing praise and worship, to lead the people into praise and worship, right? I mean, I like My baby does a hanky-panky. But that's not what God, God called us to do up here, right? Or line dancing. He didn't call us to do line dancing, right? Zechariah says, and Then answered I and said, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick upon the left side of there? And I answered and said, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes emptied the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. What, we, what, what he's saying to us, it's from a, the spiritual significance, he's saying the Old Testament and the New Testament are the two anointed ones. Amen. They're the two anointed ones in this context, this spiritual context, that stand before or by the Lord of the whole earth. And as soon as you knock those two anointed ones out of your church, forget it, you're not the church anymore. You can call yourself the church, you can say first church of the Frigidaire or whatever you want to call yourself, but you're not the church. If you knock out the word of God, and guess what? Through these new versions, they are knocking out the Word of God, left and right. And pretty soon, it doesn't matter what name they have on a church. They won't even know. They won't even remember. What did the Scripture say? Because I memorized it from an NIV version, and you memorize it from an American standard, and nobody knows what it said. Because we all memorize something different. Years ago, the English version that was accepted among Bible-believing Christians was the same one. It didn't matter whether you went to the Baptist church or the Pentecostal church or the Methodist church. When you went to vacation Bible school, you all memorized the same verse, the same words. But that's not that way anymore. First, he shows 
He shows us the engine of the Holy Spirit. Remember we said it was a seven-cylinder engine and the oil was coming through. That's the fuel lighting the flames. And if, if the flames aren't all lighting, then you've got something wrong with it. Just like, you know, you might need an overhaul on your engine. Jesus, the mechanic, needs to deal with it. But here in Zechariah, the next thing he sees is, is like this picture here. He sees, I turned and lifted up my eyes and look and behold a flying roll. After he showed the illustration of the, the Spirit, he said, this is the word of God to Zerubbabel. Then he said, then I turned and lifted. Behold, He's still talking about the same thing. He said, uh, there's a flying roll in the sky, in the heavens. He said, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. Remember, John was given a roll. Ezekiel was given or a book. John was given, or uh, Ezekiel was given a roll. John was given a little book. It's the same thing. He saw this roll flying in the heavens. The length thereof is twenty cubits. The breadth thereof is ten cubits. Then said he unto me, "This is the curse that goes forth over the face of all the earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off." as on this side according to it. Everyone that sweareth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it. Verse 4, I will bring it forth, said the Lord of hosts. It shall enter into the house of the thief, and it will enter the house that swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. What's he saying? The law, the law is still alive. And the curse of the law is still alive. And before, it, was, it only had to do with the Jews. But when the gospel went out to the Gentiles, the curse went out as well. And God is saying to the Gentiles as well, He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. We can be like Joshua, for, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But if the, law, if the world does not turn to God, the law of God and the curse attached to it will consume them. And that's why the judgment comes. And that's why we're not part of the judgment. What do we have? We have the word. Of, we, we, we were shown the word of God. This is how it works with the seven, the lamps, the seven spirits of God inside us. And then he showed us the law, the curse going out through the, the whole world. That's still the word of God. This is what? This is the canon. This is the rule. This is the rule. God says you must live by this rule. If you're going to enter into my kingdom, you have to live according to this rule. And if you're under condemnation, you're going to have to have the blood of Christ to wash you and cause you to be clean, because that's what the canon says. But, he talks about this next part of the vision. It's like a bushel basket. He says in verse 5, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now your eyes. See what is this? That goes forth in Zechariah 5. He said, what is it? He asked, what is it? He said, this is an ephah that goes forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Now this ephah was a unit of measure. Remember we said the canon of the scripture is a unit of measure. This is an alternate unit of measure. And he said, he said, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. The wind was in their wings, for they had wings like a, wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. In other words, these, um, these two women with the stork wings, a stork is an unclean bird. And if you remember in the parables, when the, the, the Satan cometh immediately to steal the word, it's a bird. It's a fowl. What he's showing is my word is the measure. This is the true measure. But the world has chosen this other means of measure, the ephah. They're going to use the ephah to measure. This is going to be their measuring line. Instead of my word. And behold, 
there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. See, he's showing the word of God as the canon, as the rule, as the measure. He said, start the judgment at the church. But what measure are you measuring your Christianity? He says there's another means of measuring that they'll be measuring with at the last days. He said inside that ephah is wickedness and he cast it into the midst of the ephah. He cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. In other words, they lifted up the lead weight and they found, they showed, the spirit showed what was hiding in that measure. It was Babylon the Great. The same Babylon the Great, that that whore in Revelation chapter 17, is sitting in this measure. And then they covered it up. In other words, the whole... What, what I believe what the Spirit is saying, there's coming a time when the whole world will see who's in the measure. What's the false measure made of? The whole world's going to see because I'm going to take it off. I'm going to reveal to the whole world and then I'm going to cover it back up. And you know what? That's what's happened. Because people are not preaching against Babylon the Great anymore. People are not preaching against the false Christianity anymore. They've made peace. You know, it's not my business, Pastor, to tell you what the Word of God says. After all, you're a different church. Well, who's going to tell them if you don't tell them? Because their pastor won't. They're using a different measure. In the measure, it's been revealed. It was revealed. We went through this when we covered uh, Sardis in, uh, in the early churches. We saw that every leader, every main leader of the Reformation, all the way down, they all said the Catholic Church was apostasy. They, they, even, said, they even said it was the spirit of Antichrist. They all did. But they don't say it anymore. I was checking out uh, just today. I was checking out a, uh, a Lutheran commentary. Martin Luther was pretty bold against against Catholic, but in the Lutheran commentary, it, it mentions that some people think that this is Catholicism, but the truth is, and then they went on to explain why this is not really Catholicism, and then they left that whole idea. But the teaching of Catholicism is Antichrist. Anyway, he said, Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said, To build it a house in the land of Shinar. Where is Shinar? It's a word for Babylon. If you look it up in the encyclopedia, you'll find Shinar is Babylon. And it shall be established and set there upon, not his own base, her own base base her own base in other words this wickedness will establish a new form of measure to tell you what is Christian and what is not Christian that's what they're doing today they don't use the word to define what is Christianity anymore they, they use politically correct ideas this is right this is right it's wrong for you to speak about any other church or any other belief no, that's what God called me to do. In fact, you saw in Ezekiel, that's what he called Ezekiel to do, and Ezekiel was told. They won't listen to me, and they won't listen to you, although I still want you to tell them. Revelation chapter 11, 3 through 6 might have new meaning here now as we look through it. It says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this Manner be killed, these have power to shut the heavens that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. 
Who's the two witnesses? The two anointed ones? The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Word of God. The Word of God tells us we have power over all the power of the enemy. It says, he said, whatsoever you ask, I'll do it. That comes from the Word of God. But we don't believe it's going to happen anymore. Look at here. This is, I found this very interesting. As we go on here, when they shall have finished their testimony, remember the testimony is those two, the Old Testament and New Testament, right? Well, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Is there or is there not a war, an outright war today against the word of God? Are they trying to kill the word of God? And you can go back and you can listen to the, the one, I just remember the word hideous. It's in, one of them, it's entitled Hidea. But there's four parts to it. We were talking about the famine of hearing the word of God on YouTube. And so you can find that. But we could see, we saw in that who the culprit is. And you can go back and, and refresh your memory on that. Horrific and insidious. The horrific and insidious whatever. Horrific and insidious whatever. Okay. And... Uh, but see, it's, he says that when the, bee, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, who is that? Remember, it's Apollyon or Ab- Abaddon. Remember, he, he actually rises out after the church is gone. So what this is telling me is that, remember we were talking about, we don't know whether we're, we'll be here and they'll actually take our Bibles away. It sounds to me like right after the church leaves... The word of God will be gone. They're going to remove. It'll be politically incorrect. The World Council of Churches will say this causes trouble. This causes division. They already equate conservative Christians that believe in prophecy like the Muslim terrorists. They got them on the same chart. In fact, they think we're worse. So let's keep reading here. This, This is fascinating. So when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, shall make war against them, and shall, or the Antichrist, shall overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, and also where our Lord was crucified. You can't have three different places where the Lord was crucified. And so the symbol here, I believe, the Lord was crucified where? In Jerusalem... And who crucified him? The religious leaders. So the religious leaders are guilty of trying to destroy the word of God. Is that what happened in today? Yes. The people in the Bible schools, in the Bible college, they're just letting it happen. The, the Christian publishing's letting it happen. Most pastors are letting it happen. Most of the church is letting it happen. You buy a new Bible for Christmas for somebody, and you, what do you do? Do you buy them a King James? No. You're going to buy them one of these new versions, because that's what we do. Well, you're helping the enemy. But it also says Sodom and Egypt. Well, Egypt had to do with all the pagan deities. All of false religion. All paganism, right? In other words, all religions are equal. That's the political correct thing, right? That's destroying the word of God. It's killing other... And the last thing is Sodom. And I spoke about the Queen James Version. And I think that's apropos. I think it fits. Because we are in the generation now where we got the LGBT friendly Bible. These things are killing the two anointed ones. 
And they, watch this in, in nine, verse 9 and 10, they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies, the word of God, as dead bodies three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in a grave, and they should, that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, shall send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. In other words, the people of the earth at that time when the word of God is, is taken away, they will rejoice. They'll say, finally, we're, we're, we're done with that Bible that causes division and causes people to think that they're, you know, one religion is higher than another religion. After all, aren't all gods equal? And the whole world will rejoice. But after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. They stood upon their feet. Great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. They ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. What is this? This is, this is God saving those who believe in the two anointed ones, who cherish the, two anoint, the Bible. Now, once again, let me say this because people that are listening, I know you understand, but people listening on YouTube, they may not understand. I'm not saying we're not to take this literal, that there's, I believe there's going to be two literal witnesses. There's going to be a literal temple built. There's going to be a literal antichrist. All these things are yet to come, but this is just... Uh, it's a, a spiritual message alongside... Uh, and another meaning based upon the fact that he says, measure the temple, and the temple is the church. Now, here's, now I don't know, I, I'm just throwing this out there, because we've read it, is, is, is it possible the 1260 days refer to 1260? I'm just throwing that out there, I have no idea, I've never heard anybody say that, I'm just throwing that out there. Remember... Open hostility, we, we talked about this in one of our lessons. Open hostility toward the religious representation began in 726 when Emperor Leo III publicly took a position against all religious icons and statues. Remember that? This resulted in their removal from churches and their destruction. There have been many previous theological disputes over visual representations, their uh, theological foundations and legitimacy. However, none of these caused the tremendous show, social, political, and cultural upheaval of the iconoclastic controversy. Now, this is just coincidental. At that time, if you take that time when that happened, when Leo set free the church of all their idolatry, and remember we showed that the judgment came because of the idolatry in the church. If you take that date and you add 1260 days, you come up to about 1986. And that's pretty close to where we're at as far as the word of God's about ready to be destroyed. It's gotten to the point where it's only, it's, it's only surviving by a few people that are, are still supporting it. A few people that are speaking out against it. But I don't see a lot of hope other than supernaturally God intervening for the word. But remember, he said the word of God will never pass away. See, that's God's promise to us. The word of God will never pass away. But is it possible that there is a reference here to the attack on the true manuscripts? I'm just throwing it out there to think about. The spirit inside you, it needs that fuel. We talked about that. But I did want to look at this. We have the Old and New Testament, which are the two anointed ones. Underneath you have the enemy, right? Um, here's a, here's a, a scripture for 1 John, verses 5, 4, 13 through 18. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, why does he mention sin? You see that? It, does, it almost doesn't seem to fit. He, he just, he said, this is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know he hears us, we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. That 
should be very simple. Ask and you shall receive. However, he adds, he says, if any man see his brother sin. And it's just like I, I said with the candles. The sin will clog it up. It clogs up the works. It clogs up your faith. This promise sounds great. But What's happened? This is what I believe in the church. Why the church has gotten weaker and weaker is we continue to allow things that are clogging up the system, and it's clogging up our light, and it's clogging up our faith. He said, "If any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All righteous, all." All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin that is not unto death. Notice, all unrighteousness is sin. In other words, just because you became a Christian does not mean there's no more sin. We have to deal with the sin. It's clogging up the system. And the word's not working because of it. Look, in, uh, then we have uh, down here, we know that whoever is born of God sins not. How many have sinned? How many have sinned recently? Well, I just read a scripture that says you're not born of God. And we know that's not the meaning. We're, we know we're born of God. Why are we sinning? Because we're, in, in many cases, we're allowing. Well, God understands. I'm just weak. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I think what's happening is we're getting exactly what we deserve when it comes to the walk of faith and things not working the way either that or God's lying to us I think it's us I think the problem's us this is why God set up um, fasting how many of you used to fast you used to fast but you don't quite fast like you used to I mean, and I, I'm being very honest with you. There, there were, I used, to, I mean, I used to fast. And all of a sudden, I'd like, well, you know what, I'm kind of old to fast. And it kind of went downhill. I mean, I was doing just fine. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you go from a five-day fast to a four-day fast. Now, now you're only doing a three-day fast. And then you're two-day fast. And then you're one day. Now, now you're just doing lunch. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's not a fast. That's skipping lunch. <laughs> and, and I mean, if that's all you can do, that, that's a fast. But you know what? It's kind of like... Remember the scripture, give and it shall be given back to you. But it says, according to the measure you use, it shall be measured back to you. So the things that you do with God, according to the measure of your commitment to God, that's the way he's going to return it back to you. I don't believe there's something wrong with God. I think there's something wrong with us. He says, we know that whoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. In other words, if you turn it around, if you don't pay attention to it, if you allow sin to continue, unrepentant, unchallenged, there, right there it says the wicked one will touch you. It's a done deal. He's coming. In these la- See, you could used to get away with it, but he's coming after us. And we need to be on the defensive. This, uh, this last scripture here, it comes from Mark chapter 4, verse 3 through 8. You're familiar with the sower sows the word? We're going to look how it's clogged up. Hearken, behold, there went a... Jesus, Jesus talking, there went a sower to sow, came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside. The fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth. Immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. What's the seed, by the way? It's the word of God, right? 
and some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. It yielded no fruit. Others fell on the good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, brought forth some thirty and some sixty and a hundredfold. And he said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these uh, things are done in parables. You notice he said, um, it's given to you to know the mysteries. Later on here, verse 13, he's going to tell you something else about how you can understand all parables. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, as seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear, not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, know ye not this parable, and how then will you know all parables? See that? Know ye not that if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. This is the key. And then he explains it. He said, the sower sows the word, so the word's the seed. These are they that come by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes next week to steal the word, right? Satan comes tomorrow at breakfast. Satan comes when it's raining. Satan comes immediately. The word is sown and Satan comes immediately, takes away the word which was sown. What happens if you plant seed and someone takes the seed and digs it up? You get no growth. You get no fruit, right? And that's what Satan does immediately. And then these are they which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a time. You see this in the church all the time. People receive, they receive the seed gladly, but they have no root in themselves. They endure for a time afterwards when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Watch this. This happens all the time to us in the church. The seed is sown, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in and choke the word. I'm going to give you an example of what a deceitfulness of riches is. A deceitfulness of riches is when we spend our whole life trying to make a buck. We don't have time for the word of God in a relationship with God Because, hey, they're offering time and a half. So I'm going to work every weekend. 